Good morning, Milton Bible Church. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just as we start, I just want to make one announcement about the Connect cards that are on your seats or every couple of seats. Please take advantage of these. If you're new, it's a great way that we can stay in touch with you. Uh, we won't bombard you with emails. We just do them once a week until you keep you up to date. Um, if you have any new information, you can fill it in. But also on the bottom, there's prayer an opportunity to be prayed for, to put a prayer request. We've got a prayer team at Milton Bible Church that loves to pray for you. So if you have any prayer requests, please fill that in. Put it in the offering plate, or if you fill it in later, give it to the Connect Desk as, uh, as you leave the sanctuary. So please do um, take advantage of that. At Milton Bible Church, as a church family, we really believe that God speaks through all of us, not just a couple of us. If God has given you something, laid something on your heart, maybe it's a song, maybe it's a testimony, maybe it's something the Lord spoke to you this week as you spent with time, spent time with him. We would love to have you share that for the encouragement and the edification of the church body. So come and see me. I'm sitting right here. We've got a microphone we would like you to use just so everyone can hear it. So please, if you feel God is is uh, stirring your heart to come and share, please come and see me. We'd love to have you do that. So as we continue to pray this, as we continue to worship this morning, let's pray. I want to start with Psalm 98 this morning. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Thank you, Jesus, for the mighty, mighty things that you have done. Thank you for the salvation that we have in you. Father, we just pray this morning that you would send your Holy Spirit in a, in a new way this morning, Lord. Give us a new song in our hearts. Do something new in our hearts today, Lord. For some people that maybe are more musical, that might literally be a new song. For some of us, it may be more metaphorical. Something, a new song, a new word, a new encouragement, a new um, excitement in our hearts for you, Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, come in a great way. God, we worship you this morning as your people, as a holy priesthood. We once, as Peter says, we once weren't a nation. Now we are a nation. We are the church. You are the head. Jesus, we honor you this morning. May you be praised and glorified. Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen? What amazing worship. You know, God is in this place. I really feel this morning. You know, it really struck me that as people were sharing this morning, we've just gone through a sermon series on spiritual gifts Pastor Mark and Jim and others brought to us. And one of the passages was Ephesians 4. They call it the fivefold ministries. And it gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What did we hear about this morning? We heard about the evangelists who went out on the street of Milton and a young, a young lady, sorry, it gets me every time, a young lady's life and eternity has just been changed. You know, in the prayer before the service, that's actually what I prayed, that the Holy Spirit would move in this place, but it happened last week, that's okay. That lady's life has changed, her eternity and probably generations beyond, it's amazing. The shepherds and the teachers, Pastor Mark is going to bring us the word of God in a moment. The prophets, Lori had someone prophetically speak to her this morning. Folks, the New Testament is not something we just read about. It's alive and active and happening today. Amen? It really is amazing. Father, we thank you so much, God, for what you are doing. I thank you, God, that you are in the storm and you are in the earthquake sometimes. And you are in the quiet. You're in the quiet of every day, of lying in bed at night, of driving in the car and busy traffic. You speak to us in those quiet moments. You speak to us in loud moments and make our heart pound. God, you speak to us in prophetic words through people who we, we kind of know but aren't necessarily that close to. But you bring us close because of you, God. You bring prophetic words. You change lives, God. You have um, changed lives in Milton and beyond. Um, and we just thank you for that, God. I thank you for how you are working here this morning. May your heart, may your spirit continue to work in each and every heart, Lord. May we all turn ourselves over to you, Lord. Last week, I think it was Mark asked the question, are we all in? God, we are all in on you. We are all in because you have done it all. You have done it. You have finished. You ran the race, Lord. We can rest in you. We can be in you. I just pray, Father, for those who are searching for you, that, that this might be the morning that they turn their lives to you. Those who have been wandering, this might be the morning that we come back to you and say, God, we're going to follow you in a new way. Not a try harder, 
us surrender more. We surrender to you and what you have done, Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for the way you work. We pray a blessing on the rest of our service. God, I just ask the welcome team to come forward now. God, we know that what we have is yours. We don't hold it with closed fists. We hold it with open hands for you to give and for you to take. Lord, we give it to you um, willingly because you can use it to build your kingdom. And that's what we ask, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, everybody. I forgot my little sheet of paper. Excuse me. So again, my name is Matt Timpson, one of the leaders here at Milton Bible Church. Just welcome, 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 especially if you're new amongst us. Please go out to the welcome desk and say hi to somebody. They've got a little gift for you, just saying thank you for coming to Milton Bible Church, and we'd love to get to know uh, more about you. A couple of announcements. I thought it was really amazing what was shared this morning. Tonight at 6.30 p.m. here in the, in the, what's this called? Celebration Hall <laughs> at the Connect Center, we're having a prayer meeting. We do prayer meetings the first Sunday this week. This month it's the second because of Easter. Um, we have a prayer meeting uh, one Sunday every month. And we kind of rotate what the theme is, and tonight is healing prayer. And Lori, thank you for bringing that to us. What we're going to be doing tonight is having a chance to pray in different stations. We're going to, we're going to worship together. We're going to have different stations that you can go in and out of. And we're going to be praying individually. You can come forward and be prayed for for one of our prayer team leaders. They will pray healing over you. We're going to pray for healing for our church family, for the town of Milton, for Canada, and for the nations. That's the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission starts in our hearts and starts praying together. We're also, during the um, worship time, we're going to have an opportunity for, as we do here, to share in testimonies, particularly about healing. So if God has healed you in any way, as Lori said, it's a, it's a healing of the heart. It's a continual healing. If you have seen that in any way in your life, we would love you to come tonight and share that with the church family. We want to encourage one another. One another. Healing, any kind of testimony we give, um, you know, a thousand, it's, what, is the, what is the saying? Something speaks a thousand words. Oh, I said silence. Anyway, um, we just want to be able to share with each other um, and encourage one another in the Lord. So I do ask you to come tonight, 6.30 p.m. here at Milton Bible Church prayer meeting. A couple other announcements. We have an NBC choir ministry that we are starting up. I won't be there because my joyful Lord to the Lord is done in the shower. Um, but I know... I just kid, actually. You don't have to have the best voice. You can come out and try out um, or try it. Um, Hugh and Abigail Coleman, thank you very much, is uh, leading the choir. So that's this Wednesday at uh, Wednesday the 17th, 7 to 9 p.m. here at the Connect Center. So come on out and we'll, put a, we'll sing a joyful noise to the Lord. Baptism Sunday is April 28th, a chance to get dunked. Um, this is walking in obedience with what Christ says. As we believe in Christ, we confess with our mouths. Um, that he is Christ and Lord. We want to do that publicly in obedience to Christ. So if you have not been baptized, whether you're 10 years old or whether you're 100 years old, we would really encourage you to do that. You can go online and uh, uh, fill in the form there. And lastly, our VBS Vacation Bible School is July 15th to 19th. So, um, spots are filling up, so go online and sign up. The theme is God's Rock Solid Truth in a World of Shifting Sands. So please sign your kids up. There's also an opportunity to help and volunteer. You won't be disappointed. Okay, last announcement. Um, Elijah, if you would run the video, and Regina, if you would come up. Good morning, women of Milton Bible Church. My name is Janet Sorrett, and I have the privilege of coming and opening God's Word with you on Saturday, April the 20th. In our first session together, we're going to be looking at a women-to-women -women ministry model from the book of Titus that is strategic and it's universal and it's divinely designed, one that if we engage in, we'll be sure to be addressing the important doctrinal and practical aspects of being a Christian and being a woman. And then our second session, we're going to be looking at a ministry model that Paul gives to the Colossian church. And it's a model that if we invest in, we're going to make sure that we're teaching what we ought to be teaching in the manner we ought to be teaching it and measuring it by all the right means. In addition to what we'll be studying here, I'm really excited to be bringing along three of our female Bible teachers from our church who teach in our women's ministry and other places as well. So I hope that you can make it out on April the 20th. We are praying that this will be an inspiring and encouraging and fruitful time. Hope to see you there. Well, well, it is that time again, annual women's conference. Who's excited? Who is excited? 
Okay, so Janet uh, Surrett is coming to speak on the Titus II woman, and I'm so excited about this, mentoring um, women with young women, old women, We're having amazing workshops as well. We have awesome food for the day as well as spiritual food. So invite your mom, your sister, your aunt, the crazy woman across the street because, you know, she needs the Lord too. Um, and, yeah, today is the last day to get the early bird pricing. Um, so register at miltonbiblechurch.ca, and we'll see you there. She meant the lovely woman across the street. <laughs> um, Let's pray for our kids, and then kids, you can head out to your, um, uh, your Power Kids program. Father, thank you for the children of Milton Bible Church. Thank you, Lord, um, for the leaders that they are. We just heard testimony at a meeting this Wednesday of how the youth are really rising up, Lord. And they're not, we often talk about them being the future leaders of the church. They're the current leaders of the church. Thank you for filling them with your spirit, giving them leadership gifts. May the, the kids have a wonderful time this morning in their Power Kids program. Amen. Amen. Okay, kids, you can head out. Um, just stand up, say a quick hello to someone beside you, and we welcome Pastor Mark. All right. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning. And uh, listen, before we get into the message today, um, I would love to just take a minute and let's just, let's just pray for the Middle East. You know, I think it was a bit of a shock to many of us uh, kind of seeing what's going on there. And, um, you know, we're, as followers of Jesus, we got to get together and we got to pray into these things. So let's just take one minute to pray into this. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather this morning, this Sunday morning, Lord. And we think of our, our um, we think of humanity really in the Middle East, Lord. We think of our, our Jewish friends, our Muslim friends, there, our Christian friends, Lord, everything in between. And God, um, we see the tensions rising there. Lord, um, and uh, from a human perspective, it's like, what can we even do, Lord? But we know we can pray. So, God, we just want to lift up the leaders and the people making decisions, Lord. May they think of the life that is on their hands, Lord. Um, may, may there be wisdom in decisions and things that are made potentially in the coming week, Lord. And would you protect the innocent, God? God, with those who follow you in the Middle East, Lord, may they be known as the people of peace, God. May, may they be known as ones who are followers of you, Jesus, who uh, are there to bring healing. Uh, it seems like there's been a focus on healing in our service this morning. Would there be healing in the Middle East, Lord? It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to see all of you this morning. Uh, as I was driving in this morning, it was pouring rain, and I said to uh, one of our congregants, Joe Brazo, I said, it's raining out there, isn't it? And he said, no, it's sunny and beautiful and nice. So don't complain about the rain because uh, it's definitely cleared up. But anyhow, we are in week two of a series, a uh, four-week series on discipleship, on discipleship. If you've grown up in the church or you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this word discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple and what does the word discipleship actually mean? Here's how we defined it last week. A disciple is a learner and follower of the teachings of Jesus and discipleship, that ship word on the end, it just means the state or condition. It's the state or condition of being a learner who studies and follows the teachings of Jesus. So two questions I want to start by asking you this morning are this. What is the condition of our disciple making at Milton Bible Church? Like how are we doing as a church in disciple making? And then for you specifically, what is the condition of of you in becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ? What's the condition of you in becoming a disciple of Jesus? I came across a great quote this week by a theologian and pastor who's passed away. His name's Dallas Willard. He once said this, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Isn't that powerful? Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. How would you behave? How would you treat others? What would your life look like if Jesus were you? I saw another quote, I don't have it on the screen, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said something like this, salvation is free, discipleship costs your whole life. And he was actually martyred for his faith. There's many discipleship models out there, but Milton Bible Church, we've landed on one that I think is wise. And I don't think it's wise because I know anything, but I think it's wise because here's the deal. If discipleship or if being a disciple 
is being a follower of Jesus, then a discipleship model should be based on how Jesus lived, shouldn't it? So if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open up to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 19. That's Luke chapter 6, 12 to 19. Um, If you need a Bible, we have some at the back, or you can use your phone if you have a phone. Um, But as you're turning there, um, Luke 6, 12 to 19, I just want to turn your attention while you're turning there to one totally different passage, but I think it kind of sets up where we're going nicely. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. He says, Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason, I've sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And here's the key. And he will remind you of my ways, which are what? In Christ, just as I teach everywhere in the church. Here's the point of this. A disciple imitates the master. Paul says, hey, you you can be imitators of me, but ultimately it's not because I'm doing anything great. It's because um, my ways are in Christ. And that's what I teach everywhere in the church, that ultimately you should be practicing and following the ways of Jesus. A disciple imitates the master. So what did Jesus do? What did discipleship look like in Jesus' life? Well, let's look at Luke 6, 12 to 19. We looked at this passage, by the way, last week. This is where we landed, so we're going to start with it this week. In these days, he went out on the mountain to pray. That's Jesus. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And then he came down with them, and he stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to uh, be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for the power came out from him, and he healed them all. There's that healing again, by the way. Here's what we see in this passage um, as, we, as we look at the life of Christ, as we look at Jesus as the one we want to imitate um, as disciples. We see a model that we call here at Milton Bible Church, and this is our model, up, in, and out. Jesus starts by going up to meet with the Father. It starts with a relationship with God. It starts with his prayer life, his quiet time, meeting with God. Jesus gathers other people who are followers of his, other people who you would say are disciples of his or Christ followers, and he spends life with them. That's his community. And uh, we can look at the great commandments of God, love God, love others, and see that there. And finally, in the last part of the passage, Jesus goes out into the world. It doesn't just stay as like something where he's like, it's just me and God and no one else. It's not just me and my community and no one else, but he goes out into the world to make disciples. This is the graphic we used last week, but if I could... um, even give more clarity to what we're getting at in how we understand discipleship and how we imitate Jesus, it would be, uh, these are not just love God, love others, go make disciples, but these are relational concepts. So I'm going to bring up the next slide here, and here's what we're really driving at. Up, it represents our relationship with God. How are you doing in your relationship with God? In is talking about our relationship with one another in the church community. That's specifically in the church community. We need to have brothers and sisters in Christ who we're doing life with, who are speaking into our lives, who are going and growing together. And finally, out. That's our relationship with our unchurched neighbor. That's our relationship with those who don't know Jesus, who are in the world. We believe that at Milton Bible Church, we want to have a healthy discipleship in the life of the church, and it requires all three of these components to be happening. So here's the question. What happens when a church doesn't have a balanced up, in, and out discipleship happening in the life of the church? What happens when you don't have these things in play? Well, there's many two-dimensional churches out there. There might even be some one-dimensional ones. But here's what happens when maybe you only have two dimensions of these going on in the church. Maybe you've been a part of a church like this or you've seen this in churches. Some churches are up and in churches. Up and in. These are churches that often have great worship, good Bible teaching, There's good community and fellowship, but they struggle to reach out to those who are outside of the kingdom of God. Sometimes they're just so insulated that they don't even think about the outreach piece. 
Or sometimes in arrogance, they say, you know what? The best way we can save people is if they come here and see what we're doing and meet Jesus on our terms. But that's not how Jesus lived his life, is it? That's not what we see Jesus modeling to us in the passage we just read or all of the Gospels. If you want the church to reflect Jesus, we have to have the out component. There's other churches out there that are up and out churches, up and out churches. It's a two-dimensional church. This is the church that does a great job with the Bible teaching on Sunday morning, and they stress evangelism. Uh, maybe even they raise, raise large sums of money, and they, they give it to mission, God's mission in the world, send it even overseas to missionaries. But the community and the fellowship is missing. It's lacking. People are driven more by a sense of duty. Sometimes I fear in our, our technological age, the, um, the, the churches that can get really good at being up and out are the ones that are online. And are, I mean, we're online, so I'm not, you know, rebuking that at all. But the ones that drive such a hard online mi ministry that you're like, man, I love that church. I love that Bible teaching. I even donate to what they're doing in the world. It's so good. Yet you could just sit at home and have no fellowship with anyone and be a part of a church like that. Is that the fullness of discipleship that God has for us? And is that how Jesus lived his life? The last one is the in and out church. Now, I think this is the name of a burger chain in the USA. Am I right about that? in and out Burger? So we could have in and out Church and serve burgers, and maybe that'll work. I don't know. These are two-dimensional churches that have lost their focus on the teachings of Christ. They've lost their focus on the teaching of God's Word, connecting with God. They often still emphasize uh, community in the church. You know, you have bake sales and church picnics and art nights and the like. They often do outreach, although it's maybe framed more as uh, social justice uh, mi ministries. And it's a church of type, but they, they miss, they miss the, the power of God and the power of connecting with the Lord in the up dimension. And of course, churches can even be one dimensional. And that, that point, they're going to be incredibly dysfunctional. But here's where I'm going. Here's the point. You and I, we each have a communal relationship with God, and we each have a personal relationship with God. We have a communal relationship with God and a personal relationship. And here's, here's what I'm driving at, because I wasn't really taught this a ton growing up in the church. I was always focused on the personal relationship with God, but here's the deal. We are in community, and in our church community, we have a relationship with God. Right now, this morning, we are communally worshiping and hearing from God together. That doesn't negate your personal relationship. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But we're the church. We're specifically Milton Bible Church together. We're family. We also have our personal relationship with God outside of the church, outside of the programs, outside of the corporate opportunities we have, you know, small groups, outreach, serving on teams. And each of us are responsible for our own personal walk with Jesus. So important. And here's the thing, in the same way that there's two-dimension churches, there's also two-dimensional Christians, and even one-dimensional Christians. And before we jump into the up dimension this morning, which we'll focus most of our time, the rest of our time on, I just want to ask you, are you a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional Christian? Are you possibly a one-dimensional or two-dimensional Christian, an up and in, an up and out, or an in and out Christian? Is there a component of your discipleship journey that's missing or lacking. My hope in this series is twofold. First, our ministry teams, our ministry leaders, right now in this season, we're working on next year's ministry plans. My hope is that for all of us who are involved in ministry teams that are thinking and planning um, begins to really incorporate this fullness of the discipleship model that Jesus lived out and that we have at our church, that we'd holistically be striving in every ministry to be up, in, and out. That's a communal thing. But second, and importantly for today, on the personal level, my prayer is that individually, each of you would be motivated and encouraged to embrace a full discipleship in your faith, that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you areas where you can grow in, and that you'd take those actions to grow in your faith, that you would be, as Dallas Willard said, to quote him, that you would become who Jesus would be if he were you. So let's jump in to the up component this morning. Let's take the rest of our time together, which won't be too long, I promise, to focus on what it means to have this up dimension in our walk with Jesus. Up is our relationship with God. 
ups our relationship with God. Growing up in the church, I want to tell you something, and I'll be really honest. I thought church was really, really, really boring. <laughs> I did. I hated going to church when I was a kid. Now, you have to understand, I grew up at a church um, in Toronto, and it was a church that was founded in the 1920s. And growing up, you know, we sang the old hymns, the old way from the old hymn book, because that's how we liked it, right? Well, that's how everyone else seemed to like it. But in many ways, and I, I don't want to rag on it because I, I think my parents, maybe their generation, really loved, loved the, the worship experience and whatnot, but I was so bored, man. And like, I'd look around the room and I'd see people just, you know, droning on, singing these songs. And, you know, there'd be that person who's like, oh, with their voice in the back, like singing louder than the worship leader. And it was just like, it was a gong show. You know, every once in a while, you'd get someone who was a bit lively in the congregation. They put their hands up and people would look at them like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why is your hand in the air? Like, are you trying to show off or something? That was the worship experience I grew up in. Now, I remember the first time I got passionate about worshiping God. And it was in that same church, um, which is a blessing uh, to me in my life. But my youth pastor took us to a concert. We went to the Queensway Cathedral. Anyone ever been to the Queensway Cathedral in Toronto? Yeah, it's like the largest church in uh, Toronto, I think. Anyway, 5,000 people to go see the Newsboys. Has anyone ever heard of the band called the Newsboys? A few of you? So this was like a Christian rock band from the 90s. And I was 12 years old in grade 7. And I went to this concert and I saw the Newsboys. I mean, worship, modern worship wasn't really a huge thing at that point in time. Like modern worship at that point was like, shine, Jesus, shine. Da, da. Great song, great song. But it wasn't, you know, like, like what we were doing this morning anyway. Um, so, but the Newsboys were praising Jesus in their own way. Rock bands, everyone was there. We're jumping up and down, kids in the thing. And I'm like, this is awesome. Why isn't church like this? This is what church should be. This is amazing. I was sweaty for Jesus, you know, uh, just gross. You can imagine 5,000 12-year-olds in a room jumping around together, no deodorant. It was awful in that regard, but it was amazing. Josh McDowell, who's a, a Christian guy who's been both an apologist, and, um, but he's also been a youth speaker, spoke, and uh, I was like, man, Man, why can't church be like this? As I grew older and I got into leading worship a little bit myself, short-lived worship leading career, I decided to be the change I wanted to see in the world. That's actually a Gandhi quote, I believe, but I think it's a great quote. I decided to be the change I wanted to see in the world. I started to lead in that way. The last formational up corporate worship experience I had in my late teens was I was about 19 or 20 years old, and um, I went to this conference called Acquire the Fire. Maybe some of you remember these things from the 90s. They were like youth conferences. This one was in Hamilton, and you went to Acquire the Fire, and they were very exciting times. But what was formational was after the opening night, I came out. And you know, you're in downtown Hamilton, so you're not sure if someone who's a stranger is like a fellow believer in Christ or someone who's going to kill you. You just don't know in Hamilton, right? But this guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, man. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, just ignore and keep walking. And he goes, hey, hey. He's like, were you at that thing tonight? And I'm like, uh-oh, maybe he doesn't like Christians. Maybe I'm really dead, right? Um, he, I, I said, yes, yes, sir, I am. He was probably a little bit older than me, not much. And he goes, I was there too. He had a very uh, raspy voice. I'm like, cool. He goes, I, I need to tell you something, brother. I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess we're talking now. We're friends. So I said, yeah, what's that? He said, when I got there tonight, I was exhausted. I said, man, I worked a long day, long day, hard construction work. I didn't even want to come tonight. And I got there. They started to worship. He said, at first, I'm like, God, I'm not worshiping tonight. I'm tired. But he said, as the worship raised up, I started to say, God, I need you. God, I love you. God, you're the best. God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And he said, my whole day changed when I began to worship God, it didn't matter how I felt. I love you, God. And I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, praise God. I mean, I still was coming out of my tradition, you know, of like hands by the side. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, that was about the extent of the conversation. But I never forgot it. I never forgot it. And I tell you, every day, that God used that maybe homeless person, probably not Christian, uh, to, to teach me something about worship, which is every time I walk into the room on a Sunday morning, 
I'm going to bring it. Doesn't matter how I feel. Doesn't matter how late I stayed up the night before. Doesn't matter how sick I feel. I'm going to bring it. And God's going to meet me in that worship experience. What about you? What's your relationship been with the corporate and communal gathering of the church? You may have a completely different experience than I. I recognize some of you in the room, you maybe grew up in a very lively church environment, quite the opposite. And maybe you're the opposite of me in the sense it was so lively, sometimes it felt unauthentic. And like people were trying to tap into something that just wasn't there. And you're maybe more reserved in worship for that reason. The up dimension is not just about singing either. It's about the gathering, the preaching time, like this where we study the Bible together and we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. It's not Mark speaking to you. It's not Jim. It's not whoever's up here. It's the Holy Spirit who's revealed the Word of God to us through the week. that We're just trying to convey to you. Are you embracing that in the communal gathering? Let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Jesus is our model. Now, in Jesus' time, they didn't do church exactly how we do church today. It was a Jewish context. But the Bible shows us that Jesus was fully engaged in this up dimension of um, the, the communal Jewish life while still establishing new Christian things. So here's some examples. Jesus did synagogue worship. He actually read the Bible and read the, the scriptures, I should say the, the Hebrew scriptures, in the synagogue. He was a part of the synagogue and communal gathering of Jewish life. He participated as well in the feast celebrations that were um, a huge part of the Jewish community, you know, um, the, the Passover times and the Feast of Tabernacles and all, all these things. Jesus was involved in the communal life of worshiping up to the Father in these things. He uh, expressed communal prayer. Luke 11, he teaches us how to pray. This then is how you should pray. He tells us when two or three are gathered together, it's communal. There am I with them. And of course, this isn't a Jewish thing, but Jesus instituted communion. Do this in remembrance of me when you gather. Do this in remembrance of me. Here's the point I'm driving at. When we gather together communally as Christians, one of the things we have to do is look up to the Father and praise Him. Give honor to God. At NBC, when we sing worship songs, we love to sing songs that focus on praising God and Him. I think of one we've sang in the last few weeks, Praise the Father, Praise the Son, Praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. It's all about you, God. That's up. You know, there's some songs out there, and I'm not going to totally bash them, but some songs I feel like when you're singing worship, they're like Jesus is my girlfriend kind of songs. It's like, I feel like this, and my feelings are hurt, and blah, 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 right? And listen, God can use anything, so I, I don't want to rag on it too hard. But we love at Milton Bible Church songs that take the focus off us, and they put it on God. It's all about Him. He'll meet with you. He'll meet with you in those moments when you start praising Him. Here's the last thing I'll say about the communal up component of our discipleship. When we gather together, I want to encourage you to engage. It's a time of worship. Come ready to worship the Father. We uh, love um, to encourage demonstrative worship here at Milton Bible Church. We are free to clap, to raise our hands, shout amen, shout hosanna, kneel, bring your worship flags. If you want to dance, dance. Do what you want to do. Why? It's not because we're like, hey, let's just do fun stuff. It's because all through the pages of the Bible, we see this kind of worship. We see King David bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem and dancing with all his might before the Lord. We read Psalms that speak of clapping our hands in worship. We see Paul saying, I wish that men everywhere would raise holy hands, lift up holy hands in prayer. We see in Nehemiah people lifting hands in prayer and falling to their knees in worship. Have you ever wondered, does the Bible say that we should raise our hands in worship? Have you ever wondered that question? It does. It does many times, but probably the most explicit is in Psalm 134, verse 2. It literally says, if anyone says, where does it say lift your hands in the Bible? Psalm 134, verse 2, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Does it get clearer than that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it does. I'm harping on it a little today because I think sometimes as Christians, um, sometimes you can think, man, people being demonstrative in worship, um, you can kind of have thoughts in your head like, Maybe you think only someone who has something super spiritual happening in their heart could do that. I want to say that's not true. 
You can come having the worst day of your life and be demonstrative. God will meet with you. Maybe you think, that person's being really showy. That's why they're doing it. They just want the attention. And, you know, the more I, you talk to almost all people who are demonstrative in worship, the more I find that they're just humble people who love Jesus, and they're just worshiping God because God saved them because they're trying to be biblical Christians. Maybe we think it's an um, outgoing person, whereas others of us are reserved. That can be a part of it for sure. But I've seen some very reserved people be very passionate in worship. Whatever the case may be, I want you to consider what the scriptures say. Go after God in communal worship. It's always been a part of our faith. It's always been a part of the scriptures. When we gather to lift God up, we go after God. And I'm not trying to tell you you have to do this specific thing or that specific thing or you'll be a better Christian or whatever. That's legalism, okay? What I'm saying is go after God and be faithful to the models of worship that we find in scripture. That's the heart of worship. I could say a lot more about how we communally pursue the up piece of our relationship with God, but I want to take the last part of this message to speak to the personal component of up. What does having an up relationship with God look like in your life individually? When I look back on my life, I had a lot of formational experiences uh, in my personal relationship with God. My parents, you know, they sent me to a Christian school and I had to learn Bible verses every week and I didn't really like learning Bible verses, but now I'm so thankful because those Bible verses are just always on the, the tip of my tongue and edge of my memory um, when I'm going through hard things. It's formational. Before I went to bed as a kid, kid, my mom or my dad or one of my brothers, they would come and pray with me. We'd read a devotion together. It was formational. I started to build holy habits that taught me to go to God in all things, to look up to him. When I was a 10 to 14 year old boy, I went to a Christian leadership camp that really developed and stressed the importance of uh, personal devotions with God, with um, spending time each day, spending time at night before you go to bed, um, spending time with the Lord. And it was really helpful to me. I want to let you in on a secret, though, this morning. You may think because I'm your pastor that I live on this other plane of existence with Jesus, that I haven't missed a daily Bible reading in 15 years that when you're at home watching Netflix, I'm on my knees praying for revival in Milton every day. If you think that, I, I'm sorry, but I have to disappoint you because I'm just a man. I'm a person like you. I have a calling on my life, but I have to prioritize my time with God each day, just like each of you. And at this point in my life, I mostly succeed in doing that, but there's days when I fail. So I want to ask you, how is your personal walk with Jesus going? Perhaps you grew up in a Christian tradition that didn't focus on a personal walk with Jesus as much. I know for some of you who maybe uh, grew up or come from a Catholic tradition, you know, the Bible was taught to you. Um, the, the stress to do good and be a good person was there. But most likely there wasn't a big emphasis on having a personal relationship with Jesus. That can be true of Protestant Christians too, by the way, depending on your experience. Your experience might just be one of going to church, praying before important family meals at Easter or when all the family gets together. You weren't not a Christian, but you didn't have this personal relationship. That was kind of a foreign concept. So why does the up component of our discipleship necessitate a personal relationship with God? Why does the up component of our discipleship necessitate a personal relationship with Jesus because that's what Jesus did. Let's see what Jesus did. It says um, in the scriptures, these are, I picked intentionally ones that aren't from Luke 6 what we, that we looked at before. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. It's in Mark. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. That's Luke. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. What does a personal devotion life look like for a disciple of Jesus? And here's what I'd say. A personal devotion life is about having spiritual disciplines in your daily, weekly, and seasonal routines. What are spiritual disciplines? Here's a lengthy definition. So if you really want the definition, you can snap a picture or email me. But it's this, spiritual disciplines are intentional uh, practices or activities undertaken to nurture and deepen one's relationship with God, 
to grow in spiritual maturity and cultivate a life aligned with the teachings and example of Jesus Christ. Spiritual disciplines are rooted in Scripture and have been practiced by believers throughout history as a means of spiritual formation and transformation. At the end of our spiritual gifts series, I spoke briefly on spiritual disciplines, you may remember. And I want to point you to just a few spiritual disciplines I listed in that series, even a couple less than what I put in that series, um, because these ones are the ones that focus on our up dimension, our personal up dimension. There's some disciplines that are corporate and communal as well. Prayer. How's your prayer life going? Do you have a prayer life? Where are some places in your day where you could incorporate prayer as a habit? Maybe in the shower, or maybe uh, it's on your drive to work, or on the go train. Maybe, you know, I call those lonely places in your day, where you're without your family, you're without others, and you could be listening to music or doing anything else, but you have a lonely place where you can spend some time with Jesus. What about solitude? Do you take time to be alone and reflect on uh, your life and on the things that God has for you, the things that God's doing in your life, the things God's leading you in? I struggle with this one a lot because I like to pack my day with stuff. I like to pack it with like, uh, like I feel like I'm wasting time if I don't have something that's either uh, work, family, productive, or entertaining. Like I need one of those things at all times on blast. And when you don't make space for solitude, you don't hear from God. Where could you be practicing solitude in your week? Maybe going on a hike. Maybe it's like, I have a hot tub, so that's my place of solitude. So I've uh, committed now to, to the Lord that the first cycle of the hot tub is for him. <laughs> okay? Isn't that so weird? Most people are like, yeah, it's for me and my wife. No, it's for me and Jesus. Okay? We're in, anyways, it's getting awkward. Okay? We're just going to keep rolling along here. Where can you have solitude um, in your day? Where can you find that space? I know if you have ch young children, that's so hard. Your kids are latched to you 24-7. Can you find that space? Can you, uh, if you have a, your spouse, can you trade off and make those spaces? Scripture. Something that's noteworthy is Jesus did not have a personal Bible that he could carry around with him. Jesus uh, was unique in that he probably memorized most of the Old Testament, so he kind of did have it up here. Um, but we don't necessarily have Bible passages showing Jesus, like, you know, pulling his Bible out and reading it. But I bet if he did have the Bible in those verses where it said he went and prayed with the Father and was in solitude, it would have also said and he was reading his Bible and hearing from God. We're so privileged to have a Bible today. Do you make time to read your Bible each day? Where does that happen? Um, I've shared this before, I think, but uh, about a year ago, I started a practice in the morning. I found I would wake up every morning, and I just told you, I fill my day, like, beginning to end. So the first thing I do is grab my phone, and I look to see, okay, what's the latest, you know, what's the latest tweets, what's the latest news story, they anyone text me, are there any messages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And God convicted me. It's like, you're not starting your day in the right place. So I have a mantra I say every single morning when I wake up, Bible before phone, Bible before phone. And at the very least, the first app I open is the Bible app. I read that verse of the day, half asleep. And I go, Jesus, please just bring this into my life. Whatever it is, I don't care. But I start there. Bible before phone. Then you can get on with your day. Later in the day, I do a fuller devotion, but I just want to start with God. Generosity. This might initially seem like a strange one, but generosity is a test that really asks the question, whose stuff is it? Is it your stuff is it, or is it God's stuff? It's a test of the heart. And I found when you have an abundance mindset, a mind that says everything I have is God's and is more than enough to share and give and go around, God has a way of honoring that kind of generosity. You can't outgive God. Sabbath. Do you take Sabbath each week? God rested on the seventh day of creation, and once every seven days, we should be resting too. In the Old Testament, it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It means set apart. Don't just take a day off, uh, sorry, that means don't just take a day off for you once a week, but keep it holy and set apart um, and actually hear from God in that time, that Sabbath. I found when I was a kid, it was a lot easier to do Sabbath because every store was closed on a Sunday. I don't know, if some of you remember that for years, I was, it stopped when I was about 10, um, but I remember we actually couldn't do anything. Our world's so busy now, you got to fight for that Sabbath time. The last thing I'll just speak into is fasting. 
is fasting a part of your spiritual disciplines? It's been a significant part of my practice in the past years, but I lament that I've been weak on it in recent years. I'll be honest with you. A few years ago, I preached a sermon here at NBC before I came on the staff team. And I was encouraged about a month or so ago, someone came up to me and said, hey, do you remember that random sermon that you preached on fasting a long time ago? They said, I actually took it to heart and I've been practicing fasting ever since. And I've seen God move in powerful ways through it. I think that's so cool. I think it's so cool. And it's inspired me to say, I got to get back to my fasting. I don't have time this morning to like fully unpack these spiritual disciplines, but I want to share them with you because these are the things that Jesus practiced. These are the disciplines Jesus used to connect up with God in his personal walk. If you're interested in cultivating the spiritual practices that will help you in your up relationship with God, I have a couple books I'd recommend to you. The first one I mentioned last Sunday, it's called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. Be with Jesus, become like him, do as he did. And John Mark Comer, he walks through spiritual practices like the ones I just shared that you can incorporate into your life. The other one that uh, I have read through is The Common Rule by Justin Early. Habits of Purpose for an Age of Distraction. And Justin's really resonated with me because he, like me, was a very distracted person. And he built habits, holy habits, that would help ground him in his walk with Jesus. And you got to be careful because this can become legalism, right? And we're not into a gospel of legalism. We're not into a gospel of do better. But there is a piece where we do have to do a bit of work, right, in our walk with Jesus. We can't just be like, ah, if I feel like it, if the Holy Spirit leads me, I'll do it. We've got to build these habits, build these disciplines in our walk with Jesus. A friend of mine years ago put it this way. He said, I don't always feel like taking the garbage out, but I love my wife enough that I do it even when I don't feel like it, and it's better for the family. And it's the same with our disciplines and walk with Jesus. We may not always feel like doing it, but it's going to be better for our walk with God, and it's going to be better for us when we have it. I want to invite our worship team to come on up this morning. We're going to be winding things down. I apologize, it's a long message today. A preacher with a long message, who heard of that? Anyway, I want to finish by asking, are you an up, in, and out disciple of Jesus Christ? And how are you doing in each of these pieces? Is there one you're stronger on? Is there ones that you want to grow in? Specifically today, though, when it comes to this up piece that we talked about, how are you doing in your communal and personal walk with Jesus? I put this little slide up that I, I find for me practical stuff helps. And so if you were to put a scale of 1 to 10 of like 1, really, really weak, 10, really, really good, how would you, where would you put yourself? How are you doing in your relationship with God? An interesting exercise I do these days now, um, just from a few months ago from a group study I was in, when I put whatever dot is when I rate myself on a scale like this, put an arrow in the direction you're trending. It's helpful. Are you a 7 trending down or are you a 3 trending up? It's helpful to be thinking about those things. How are you doing communally in your up, personally in your up? And here's the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just encourage you with as you're thinking about that number. What's one thing God might be asking you to do today? What's one piece? Like we've covered a ton of ground. We've covered the corporate worshiping all inside. We've covered different spiritual disciplines and practices and things. But is there one thing, is there one step you can make even today in this moment that's going to trend you in that upward direction as you dig into your relationship with God, as you dig in to go up with the Father. Well, I thought it would be super cool today to end on a high note. Sometimes we end on, not a low note, but a more serious note. I thought, man, we're praising God. We're talking about Jesus. So I asked the worship team to bring it today and to bring a song that would really just help us connect with God as we head out into the world. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Let's praise God. Amen. Jesus, I don't know how to follow that up, but I don't need to. Um, Chris McLean, who attends here quite regularly, always says that the Holy Spirit thrills us, fills us, and the Holy Spirit fills, thrills, and spills. So as he has thrilled you, as he has filled you, may it spill out of you this week. Have a great week, everybody. We hope to see you tonight at the prayer meeting. Speaking of prayer, we have two prayer teams on either side. They would love to pray for you, pray for healing, healing, pray for fullness of the Spirit. Anything you want to come for prayer, they're available for you. Have a great week. See you tonight.